everyone, and welcome to a Modern Sales Pros event. I'm super excited to get started with this amazing topic, how to win selling. But before we begin, I'll let folks give folks a couple more minutes to trickle in, and I'd love to ask our panelists here today a fun little icebreaker question. Now that we're in the full swing of fall, autumn in the North America region, what is your favorite thing about fall? Whether it be pumpkin spice or are you a big football fan? I'd love to know. Um, ben, we'll kick things off with you first. Cool. That sounds great, Angelica. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. I would say uh, for me, I actually live in the Phoenix Valley area. So I don't really get fall in the traditional sense, but what I get most excited for in the fall is the, the weather goes from 110 every single day to a much more moderate 80 to 90. Um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to more moderate weather here in the Phoenix Valley. Nice. Um, what about you, Graham? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. So I love the, the fact that the, uh, the NFL the football season's back, but also college sports um so uh i cannot watch in my spare time enough sport um so yes the fact that the fall brings a lot of those um even the english premier league um where i'm a, a big liverpool supporter um so all of those things um make for a, a really fun fall who do you root for for nfl i'm a dallas cowboys fan um Ooh. when i first, oh, no. first moved from london to uh to the us i i landed in dallas so you know, you can change a lot of things, but you can't change your allegiance to your sporting team. So um, I have to stick with the, I have to stick with the Cowboys, and that's been twenty years of suffering. So optimistic for this season. Very nice, a, Tomo, a Tony Romo fan, uh, Mark. What about he's you? Probably, he's probably the best commentator on uh, in in sport. Him and John McEnroe are my two favorites. So uh, when it comes to uh, calling plays, he literally sees it before it happens. He's fantastic. Agreed. What about you, Mark? What's your favorite thing about fall? My favorite thing about fall is hearing people use the word autumnal. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. <laughs> it's, That's it's, very, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very uh, European. It's, uh, we don't use the term fall in, in Europe. It's always autumn. So yeah, autumnal is is that word that I'm I just feel familiar. smarter when I'm in a conversation where that word is used. And so I just, you know, that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's how I'm feeling right now, Mark. That's how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thanks for sharing and let's get started. So today's event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. For those of you who are not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and enablement, aka our modern sales pros. Our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer questions they struggle to solve on their own and help them to see around corners they may not know about. We do this through live sessions like the one you're at today. We also have an online robust forum, and we also have our quarterly summits, and we also have our in-person events. We actually had a happy hour at Dreamforce last week, and I hope uh, that we got to see you there in person last week. So if you're not already a part of MSP, you'll be invited to join right after this event. And a few housekeeping roles. If you have a question for our lovely panelists today, please use the Q&A function at the top right-hand corner and also leverage the chat and let us know where you're calling in from. Second, this panel is being recorded, so if you have a friend or colleague who couldn't make it, rest assured, the content along with the slide deck and any blog posts or articles mentioned and the recording will be made available on the MSP previous event page before the end of the day. Next, I'm super pleased to announce our sponsor for today's event, Highspot. Highspot is a sales enablement platform that reps love. They empower companies to elevate customer conversations that drive strategic growth. Their intuitive platform combines intelligent content management, training, guidance, customer engagement, and actionable analytics. GTM teams use Highspot to deliver a unified buying experience that increases revenue, customer satisfaction, and retention. I'm going to drop their link in the chat to learn more about Highspot. High Spot. Now enough about MSP, I'm super pleased to introduce our speakers for today's session. I'm going to actually pass it off to Ben, who will be moderating to the, today's session, and I'll come back for closing remarks. Ben, take it away. Thanks, Angelica. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me and excited that you were able to join. 
Like Angelica said, my name is Ben Pearson. I run the sales team at Nevatic, and what we do is provide a no-code solution that enables teams to build product tours of their software that enables prospects, customers, buyers to go through their product maybe prior to purchase. So you've probably seen a lot of interactive demos on websites recently, uh, and that's what we do at Nevatic. Uh, Graham, I will uh, kick it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh Appreciate it. It's good to be here. Um, I joined Highspot um, 60 days ago. Uh, I have a two decades plus in, in enterprise software. Um, companies like Success Factors pre and post acquisition by SAP, uh, Box through uh, all of their earlier growth years. And uh, it's great to be here um, at, uh, at Highspot. Great opportunity. I think, um, you know, looking at the whole sales tech stack and, and the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, is is really top of mind for so many different people's people when we have to get more out of less um, and really focus on optimizing what we have. So uh, really excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Happy to have you. Mark, over to you. Yeah, I'm Mark Costaglo. I'm currently the CRO at Catalyst. Uh, we help you grow and retain your customers in a more efficient way. Uh, I'm more, more probably known for my role at Outreach, where I was employee one and have led and led sales up through over two hundred million dollars in revenue, and uh, having some fun getting back to the building stage at a younger company uh, like Catalyst. Yeah. And Mark, I got to say, I'm a, a huge fan of, of the work that you do. I've been following you really closely on LinkedIn for a while now. So love the content that you push out. We find it super helpful at a, the smaller stage company that we're at right now in Nevada. So excited to chat today. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate that. You don't get much earlier than employee number one, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> Cool. Uh, well, today's agenda is going to be an awesome conversation. Here are the kind of loose topics that we are going to guide the conversation with, and then a few others sprinkled in as well. So excited to touch on uh, top sales challenges and goals, how we can accelerate rep productivity through sales enablement, how we can best optimize the sales tech stack to drive business results, especially in today's economy, and then why and how a people-centric culture is absolutely crucial to maximize revenue growth. So excited to cover these points, but please feel free to uh, share any additional questions in the chat as well. We'll make sure to cover those. Great, well, let's go ahead and get started. The first topic today, truthfully the one I'm, I'm probably most excited about, looking forward to, to pick both of your brains on this, is really hyper-focusing on the main question here. What you find is most important to prioritize today as an organization in order to be successful in the selling environment, including today's uh, economy like we already discussed. So um, Graham, we'd love to pass this over to you to lead us off here. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, the, the macroeconomic environment is, is the biggest headwind that we're facing. And I don't think that that's going to uh, change, certainly not for the next you know four to six quarters. Hopefully it will... Maybe we've seen the worst, but uh, I do think it's still going to be um, a challenge moving forward for, for quite some time. When we're talking to companies, there's no nice to haves anymore. Um, you have to be uh, very mission critical and you have to position yourself uh, with very distinct and clear and near term ROI. Um, and it, it really is uh, sometimes down to looking at being cost neutral, um, so cost take out, uh, looking at what you can replace, how you can up level, and then linking, uh, you know, your their investment or partnership in uh, in in a relationship to very clear outcomes, uh, linking to KPIs at a at an executive level. It really has to have that executive impact. Um, it has to drive real results. It has to have short-term ROI, and it really has to to drive uh, efficiencies uh, without taking on additional costs. So, you know, it's really important to have a very clear um, value proposition to link it to to real data uh, to sell uh, at a at a high level within organizations and ensure that you're on the critical path. Yeah, I love that, Graham. And quick follow-up question for you there. I know it's only been a few weeks since you, you joined here, and maybe this is more of a broad question. Mark, I'd love to get your perspective on this as well. But given the econ economy and the climate that, Graham, you just outlined, the sellers in your org who are having a lot of success, 
for your past organizations. Why is that? What are they doing that's different than everybody else? Because we've all been on LinkedIn and seen how kind of daunting things can be right now. So the sellers at a high spot, at a catalyst, who are having a ton of success in today's economy and the climate, curious, what are they prioritizing or maybe doing a little bit differently? Yeah, I think sales enablement is very critical. Um, you have to have uh, the sales team equipped to go out and execute against the opportunity and consistently drive performance. Too many companies see 80% of their revenues coming from 20% of their, their field organization. So trying to get more productivity from more of the sellers is, is really important. And, and that's necessary to drive the efficiencies uh, because go-to-market is expensive. So having that bell curve and enabling and equipping, equipping um, you know, training and coaching your teams to actually, you know, go out and execute against that opportunity consistently with the right messages um, that resonate with customers and making sure that those best practices are shared and those initiatives are, are, uh, are, are very clear to those sellers is really important uh, to execute at a, a very efficient level. Um, so really, we want that bell curve within uh, rep productivity and we want to continually invest in excellence to drive that and move that bell curve slightly further to the right, driving additional sales um, efficiencies. So, you know, investing in equipping, training, and coaching um, those mm -hmm. teams in a continuous loop is absolutely critical to, to driving to the economies that every company needs in order to thrive. Makes sense. Appreciate it, Mark. Um, would love to hear your perspective on the most important things to be prioritizing right now in selling in today's environment. Yeah, I think this is a, a critical question. So when things take a downward turn, especially when in most companies it's been as uh, as in, as big a downturn as it has been for them, is that there's a sense of panic that happens. And what I've noticed in a lot of leadership teams, when panic sets in, the number one way that they feel better about themselves as leaders is to introduce change. And so when there's a big panic, guess what happens gets introduced a lot of change and they lose that like common human thread that people can only digest and, and execute on so much change at a time. And when you lose that perspective of, could I do all the change I'm asking these teams to do? I probably couldn't. So I probably shouldn't shove that much down their throat. That's, I think, the top business challenge right now is what is the most impactful, simple change that you can do with your team that will actually make a difference rather than shotgunning a whole bunch of change and hoping stuff sticks. So I think that companies that really can focus in on like those key, key, key things are going to have a real competitive advantage over companies that are just, you know, been mass changes because that makes the leadership team feel better when they're talking to the board about all the changes they've made. Yeah. And I think that is, that's absolutely even more critical today where we have workforces that are highly distributed and, and often remote. Um, we're in the office less than we have ever been before. Um, you know, the, the world has changed. So having programs and being able to drive that um, enablement and, you know, to impact and change that quickly. It's really important to have structure and governance and also be able to measure uh, so that you can see what's working um, and do more of it. And then what's not working and course correct very quickly. But, um, you know, the world is increasingly competitive. Uh, the, the macro that we talked about is, is a headwind. Uh, we need to to really uh, be better than we have ever been before, and in, in order to, um, to to win. Yeah, and just you asked Graham another question about like what are the successful sellers doing now? To me, it's one thing they're working harder, like they're putting in the hours, they're putting in the time, they're putting in the effort, they're putting in the focus, the concentration, and the execution. And what does that mean? Does it mean that they're just staying up till midnight making cold calls? No, that we know that'll burn somebody out. That's not what it is. I'm seeing my best sellers, the best sellers I've ever worked with. What they're doing is they're taking advantage of the materials and processes put in front of them and they're doubling down on improving themselves. And I have more reps right now that I know that are taking courses to learn more about sales that are digging into their uh, their platforms like high spot to understand what materials are available to me 
and they're digging into personal coaches and things like, um, you know, off sites and uh, immersions in order to better themselves. Now is it so, and you might, that might be like counterintuitive. Why would I invest in myself when things are tough? It's very simple is not only will you do better in tough times, but when things come back, you will win a disproportionate amount of what comes back if you are poised and ready to take it and on your toes and working hard. If you're sitting around making excuses now, you're gonna miss the comeback by three or four months and you're gonna miss a couple of huge commission checks. If you get ready for it now and you act like this is the new reality, when it comes back, you're gonna be poised and on your toes to take advantage of it. So I hate to say it, I might be old school. I'm telling all the kids to get off my lawn. But the way that you're successful right now is you work your ass off, get busy, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I think there's a, couldn't agree more, Mark, but there's there's also another um, important point, And that is we want our, the, the people with the skill sets we've employed them for actually using that skill set. So 74% of reps time is is often not selling because they're doing a lot of other stuff. So the yeah. more we can equip them quickly with the information that they need to execute against a sales play or to get up to speed quicker and reduce the ramp time or you know really just increase rep productivity overall by pulling together and using maybe you know ai to do the research and structure that information the quicker they can find what they're looking for the more time they have selling so that's where we're really focused on how do we get the right information in the hands of the right people very quickly to ensure that they're spending most of the time doing what we've employed them to do. And that is to sell. Mm -hmm. I learned early on in my leadership career, there's three reasons why somebody doesn't do their job. One, they don't know what to do. Two, they don't know how to do it. Or three, something external is getting in their way. We know the external thing exists right now with the market conditions that we have, but the other two we can control. You can tell someone what their job is and you can show them how to do it. And so if you can control two out of three, you should be able to win. And so I don't I don't let my teams like, listen, I know it's harder and I'm sympathetic to every deal is hairy and everything really takes like a lot more effort than it has. But I'm also not sympathetic because I do a very clear job of saying this is what your job is and this is how I expect you to do it. And if you listen to that, then guess whose problem it is if it fails? It's my problem, not yours. So let make my, make your problem or performance my problem because you're doing everything I'm asking and it doesn't work. Graham, anything else to add there? Otherwise, that's a pretty smooth this smooth transition into the next question. No, I, I think it's uh, we're all in in violent agreement on this one. It, it's really important, um, more important than ever before. And you know, we just know that having looked at our customers, um, you know, when you do take an approach and you do employ um, the right enablement platform that, you know, we've seen uh, 70% improvement on in ramp time for reps and an 18% increase in rep productivity. That's massive. And that's actually a CFO message because that literally drives, um, you know, to the bottom line. So uh, with the investment in, in, in you know, go to market, it's really important to, to be more efficient than ever before because we can't just add quota capacity like we used to do in the growth yeah. at all cost days. We have to get more out of what we have or even sometimes less. Um, so it's it's absolutely mission critical. And this is a board level discussion. I mean, if you look at pretty much every company right now, they, they're they looking at what they can do to become more efficient, to get more out of what they have. Um, so I, I you know, I'm super passionate about this. Um, so yeah, I think great conversation. I love it. Well, in line with that, the, the next slide we have and the question we're excited to dive into is how we do that, how we get there, which is obviously enabling our reps. And as we can see, we have some pretty exciting metrics from the high spot team around um, ramp time and increase in rep product productivity over the last years via sales enablement programs. Um, so Mark, I'll, I'll hand this one over to you to, to lead us off here. Where do organizations need to focus their sales enablement programs to drive more sales productivity? So unfortunately, I think that the term sales enablement program is uh, distilled down in people's mind to a connotation of training. Yeah. If you think you're going to save your sales reps with more training, you're wrong. A program is a series of steps that you do over time that introduces a change in behavior and helps somebody execute that change in behavior. 
So if you think about it from like a brain science standpoint, most people do things the way that they know how. Why is that? Because there's a neural pathway that it's easier for our thoughts to transfer down that causes us to act the same way every time. And we get expected results when we did that. And our, our brains don't like unexpectedness because it has to kick in a whole bunch of other functions it doesn't like. What you have to do is you have to do the hard work of burning a new neural pathway for people to think about a process or a system or a meeting or whatever the right way so that they can use that as their default way of behavior. And so I think that like the number one problem with, uh, with rep productivity through sales enablement is people think at just do a training. And if you're thinking just do a training, you're missing out on what actually enablement is. It's a program. It's a series of steps that helps somebody with change management and behavior management and behavior change is the hardest thing on the planet for humans to do. So you got to really be thoughtful about how you do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's literally guided selling, um, stepping people through uh, the process of what to say when and how to say it, how to position it. And, and then ultimately, personalization, you've got to link it. You can't just talk about um, something generically. You have to actually um, position it in a way that is linked to the customer that you're selling to, make it relevant to them, to the KPIs of the seller that you're you're, um, you're, you're, you're focused on your, you know, if it's a, a, a CRO or if it's a head of enablement, or if it's somebody within, um, the C-suite that's, that's looking at the financial metrics of the company, like the CFO, you've got to talk in their language. So enablement is very much a program and it's, it's, it's a program that you, the company has to buy into. And ultimately, um, it can be specific to a sales play, a market, it could be specific, specific to uh, a customer. Um, you know, it, it has to be very relevant, very targeted and very tailored. And then the two, the other two other things that are really important for its success is you've got to have governance and you got to have visibility so that you can actually drive and look at the metrics and therefore ultimately drive um, outcomes associated with those metrics um, and course correct. Do more of what is working and do less of what's not. So uh, there's a number of things that are very different to just training, uh, whether it's sales training, uh, like we've done many, many times over over our, our careers, or it's it's actually a, um, you know something specific to product or even value engineering. All of that has to come together and ultimately you have to drive enablement, which is all of those component parts driven in a way that's that's programmed, measured, and and ultimately you can continually feel the pulse of what is having an effect in, in and what is what is making positive change versus what is not, and then course correct uh, as as you see appropriate. And it, and it sounds like you guys will take care of the, the links, Ben, but uh, probably one of my top 10 LinkedIn posts of all time is where I present a framework for enablement programs. It's a nine box, so a three by three grid. On the bottom X axis is mastery. Like how good do you want your reps to be at this? Because back in the day at Outreach, every time I do something, Manny Medina would expect it all to be done absolutely perfectly after 10 minutes. And so I needed to make sure I manage the expectations of if he hopped on a call, how mastered would our reps be at this thing? And the more mastery, the more in-depth the program, the more, the greater the investment on the mm -hmm. Y axis was cognitive load. In other words, like how much work were we going to have to do to change the mind or burn that neural pathway for the rep? Like how hard would it be? Is it just clicking a different button in the CPQ? Not a big deal. Is it asking new kinds of discovery call questions? Huge cognitive load for someone to change that behavior. Right. So then you got that nine box. And what you do is you plot on the nine box. Is it where you want this project? I want this a high level of mastery and it's a huge cognitive load. Guess what? That takes a quarter long project program that has to have weekly reinforcement that is all the way taken down to the frontline manager. We're going to manage our teams differently based on that. That's the only way to do that type of that type of change. And that's the change that most people are thinking they're going to get with every single training that they do. Versus, hey, we're going to take this small training that we don't really need people to be super mastered on, and we're going to do that digitally with a one-time video. And if it sticks, it sticks. If it doesn't, it's not a big deal. You can do a lot of those, right, because that's a low lift. But you really have to plot out in a quarter 
what you think is digestible by your reps and then take each of those projects and make sure that you are not adding up to so much change that someone can't comprehend. But that's a post I did on LinkedIn. That was probably one of my top 10 posts of all time that I think is provides a really strong framework of how to nail what kind of enablement you want to do in a quarter and how to make sure that you have the right programs to support it. I love that. I would love to check that post out myself, Mark. Um, final question on this topic before we continue moving on here. I'm really excited and um, just for the purposes of time, maybe whoever it speaks to the most can jump in for this, but I was really excited to ask you both, what do you think the biggest miss is consistently for enablement? For sales leaders, for teams, what is something that Mark and Graham in your career you consistently see is a miss in enablement that is something that teams skip over? They don't spend enough time on it. Maybe it's the perspective or lens in which they're viewing enablement. What is a consistent miss that you could recommend to our listeners today uh, to sort of avoid? Egos. <laughs> Raps thinking that they don't need to invest in enabling um, and you know, stepping up uh, their game, regardless of how good they are. Um, so I think, you know, buy-in across the business is is really important. You've got to have engagement and you've got to have consistent engagement. Um, this is not something for some of the organization or a, a, a subset of the organization or low performers or people on pips. This is ultimately going to lift up the, uh, the, the, the performance of the organization overall. And we've seen in a number of organizations that when those top reps start using, um, it, it's literally a light bulb switches on in their head of like, wow, this is actually going to make me even better. And I'm going to be able to uh, adapt my messaging and, and stay relevant in the markets that I'm serving better than ever before as a result of buying into um, the help that I'm getting from this enablement uh, platform. So it, it's not, you know, it, it's really, it has to be something that people and organizations, again, at a senior level buy into and explain why this is going to make the, the company better and each individual can con contribute towards that, but we need consistent buy-in. I, I think that there's a singular point of failure in enablement that's so obvious that I, it just blows me away. And that's if I am a football coach and I show game video of proper blocking technique for the offensive line, and then we don't go on the field and practice it, can I expect my players to do it in a game? If I'm an award-winning playwright and I hand this you know, Emmy-winning actress or whatever a script, but we never rehearse it one time, can I expect her to get on Broadway and deliver an award-winning performance? No. But guess what we do every single day in every single sales org on this planet? We have people go to a stupid training and then we expect them to execute it perfectly in the next sales call. It just doesn't work that way. That's called practicing on your prospects. That's a surefire way to like get yourself in major trouble. So I think mm -hmm. practice is the number one thing that's missing in enablement. And our, I'm going to, you know, play partially blame that on frontline managers Frontline managers, like if you're listening, listen to this. All right. Practice stuff with your freaking frontline reps. If you can't do it, they can't do it. If you won't do it, they won't do it. You better do it. Learn how to do it great. Show your reps how to do it. Model it on the phone. Model it in Zoom calls. Model it in role plays. And then tell them how to make sure that, that make sure that they're doing it then. I'm telling you, like that my biggest advantage as a Revenue leader is street cred. I just jumped on cold calls last week with my team. Guess who converted three out of 15 connects into meetings? Me. Guess who writes a email objections? I do. And why, somebody might say, Mark, that's too low level for you. The amount of street cred I do by investing in that stuff and showing people that I can do the job that they do allows me to get uh, so many efficiencies on the backside that it's worth every minute of investment I make. So you know, sorry to go off on a little tangent there, but I'm, I just really chaps my hide that the expectations that revenue leaders have for sales reps, but they, when they don't use the common sense of like, when are we actually practicing this stuff? Cause your reps are practicing it in live calls with customers and buyers right now. I guarantee it. And they're not doing well. Don't practice on your prospects. I love don't that. practice on the prospects. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And the role, the role of leaders at every step in, in the organization, um, absolutely critical. And those leaders need to be leading by example, uh, to Mark's point, hundred percent agree. 
Great. Well, let's let's keep moving. I think I'm doing a pretty bad job time wise as a moderator here, so I'll uh, I'll step it up a little here, <laughs> fellas. Um, but uh, Graham, why don't we kick it over to you to talk a little bit about tech stack? So, what are the must have layers of your sales tech stack, and where can leadership consider trade offs or consolidation in their investments? Yeah, it's really interesting. We were we were doing an exercise uh, internally where we were looking at what's critical in our tech stack as we we made sure that we weren't spending more money than we needed to. And uh, somebody made the comment in the room, oh, well, this has been done to us everywhere else, right? So back to what we talked about earlier on is, is you've got to be deemed uh, essential in that tech stack, especially in the current economy. Um, I see a number of, uh, of, of components that are absolutely essential to, to me in, in any tech stack uh, on, on the sales tech side. And that is you've got to have a CRM. Um, you know, it's the baseline for everything. Um, you've got to have revenue intelligence and um, you got to have revenue engagement. And there are a number of companies in, in each of those spaces that ultimately compete or overlap slightly. But I think those three components are absolutely essential to uh, driving uh, uh, execution against the opportunity and ensuring that you have the data, um, you're using that in the right way um, for revenue intelligence, which is everything from, um, you know, territory planning, ensuring that you're, you've got the coverage right, you've got your sectors set up, um, and then ultimately forecasting your, your forecasting in, in, in the right way. Um, and you're, you're, you're ultimately predictably um, forecasting, um, especially when you're driving and becoming a publicly traded company, predictability is absolutely uh, essential to, to your survival as a publicly traded company. So making sure that you have uh, that intel and you're 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 executing uh, very efficiently and very predictably is 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 really critically important. Uh, the enablement side is is very. Uh, we just talked about it for the last sort of 20, 30 minutes. Uh, you know, equipping the investment that you're making go to market to ensure that they're the very best um, uh, at what they do is absolutely critical to drive the productivity that you need. Um, and then, you know, the, the engagement uh, across the business, you know, it's, it's literally how do you, you know, the, you know, the outreaches, the gongs, the sales lofts, the, there's a lot of companies who, are, who sit in that space that ultimately um, help you drive um, the optimization when it comes to go-to-market overall. But, uh, you know, there, is, there will be some consolidation across the, the sales tech stack. There is some overlap. Um, but at the end of the day, I think those are the core components that are absolutely critical to get it right. Uh, so I, I think that uh, Graham's exactly right. You have to start with CRM. If you don't have that, you might as well not buy anything else. And then I find that there's four pieces of technology you need to have outside of that. One is your sales engagement platform that you know automates how you reach out and engage with people the second is a forecasting tool that helps you understand like where it's going on with your revenue the third is a conversational intelligence piece that gives you that world world information about how calls are going and then the last is like a post sales revenue management system that allows you to monitor what's going on with your customers how they grow and how you can expand them and and get ahead of uh of uh churn events so that you don't have like too much um uh, you can increase your re retention. I think that those are the five things that you need. But honestly, what do you need before you think about all the tech stack stuff is you need a great culture. And like a lot mm. of people worry about the fringes. And to me, like tech stack is the fringes. I can get any tool set to work in the culture I create. I don't, it doesn't matter what the tools are, but like if, if you're going to talk to me specifically about um, technology, those are the, the four, four or five bits of technology I think that you have to have in order to run a real revenue machine. And I think there is one falsehood out there that I'm talking about a lot recently or, you know, recently in a, a few of the talks I'm doing like at Saster and I have one at the CRO summit tomorrow, which is, you know, what 92% of, of lifetime value of customer happens after they sign the first deal. And yet, so that's a, a 10x difference, right? Not 8% versus 92%. That's a 10x difference in revenue. But we put 10x more thought and planning into the pre-sales acquisition funnel than we do into the post-sales customer retention and expansion model. And until people wake up to that, there's always going to be a problem because the SaaS model dictates 
that you must pay more attention to post-sale in your customers than acquiring new customers. We just have a bunch of old school leaders that grew up in the perpetual license software world where they were just pumping the top of the funnel with everything they got because the onus of value creation was on the, the buyer, not the seller. In the SaaS world, the onus for value creation is on the seller. And you better make sure that you're providing recurring value if you want to uh, have the rewards of recurring impact. And I think right now the it's offset. There's too much focus on top of the funnel. And listen, I came from outreach. We're the experts. We created how to do top of funnel uh, in a modern sales world. And now I'm at Catalyst because I believe that the public sales world is being completely overlooked. And I think that that's where the real money is in the current in the current economic environment. And if you run a SaaS based business model. Yeah, I completely agree, Mark. That's that was that was fantastic. I really, I really appreciate that. That was great. Graham, please go ahead. If we're talking about, you know, people centric and culture, um, you know, it, it the, the really is when it comes down to the, the difference between good and great is execution execution is only possible with people that buy into the mission vision and value of an organization and are prepared to step up because at the end of the day you can have all of the enablement all of the tools everything uh, in place but if people don't want to you know ultimately beat down the door um and and you know the door opens and and they're they're able to walk through then it's, it's not going to open for them and they're not going to be invited in. So it is really important to have people that believe um, that people uh, be, people want to be there. Um, they want to help each other. And you've got that culture or that competitive culture of winning. And I think it's really important to, um, to reward the top performers that set an example and, and to ensure that they are um, showcased internally to that's that's your best recruitment tool uh track and retain to attract and retain talent is is you know the rewards for those efforts are, are clearly um shown internally but also you manage out your low performers because again there's nothing more demotivating for top performers is to see the acceptance of mediocrity in any organization and really we don't have and again back to the economy we don't have the ability to, um, to to kind of just let people coast. So I think showing that you are always striving for the best to have that organization competitive internally, helping each other, but wanting to win because they see that you are helping them, uh, you are equipping them, you are training them, you are coaching them, and ultimately you're helping them be better to the point where they're starting to self-actualize and they're surprising themselves with their own performance as a result of your investment in them. And if you can do that um, and you can create that winning culture, I've seen it a number of times before, you know, in the growth years at success factors and, and in the, in, in the growth years at box uh, pre and post IPO, it was again, an incredible culture where people were competitive internally. People really bought into that, you know, the, the North star of the org and the mission, vision and values um, that we had, and they were clearly communicated and reinforced internally. And people loved that. People loved being part of something that they felt was a movement as much as a company. I love that. I think also, Graham, something you said that resonated with me is people sort of start to assimilate to the culture that they're in. And so it's really important to retain those high standards. But we always talk about internally creating a winning culture. If you're on to use like a football team, for example, we've talked a little bit about that today. If you're on a team like the Patriots for 20 years where you're just winning, and winning and winning, you know, that's the expectation. You know, that's the standard. I won't call out any other NFL teams here, even though I want to like the Chicago Bears. But like if you are in an organization that is pretty used to losing, you get used to that. Right. And it becomes harder to win than it used to be because you're in an organization that year after year continues to lose. And it feels like there's that acceptance of losing. Um, and it kind of becomes the routine. So not only establishing a culture, but making sure it's a culture of success and thrive and winning uh, because people get used to what they're surrounded by. Yeah, success um, breeds success. And, and it, you know, like businesses is, is like sport. It's all about momentum. And if you've got momentum moving in the right direction um, and you're, you're a winning culture, then, you know, it is, it is, it is something that usually sustains for, for a period of time until something gets in the way and you've got to, 
try and anticipate those challenges uh, and get out in front um, and do something about them so you can maintain that momentum. Um, and yeah, 20 years of success, Patriots, you know, there's a certain name comes to mind. And, uh, you know, when you, when you set a level of excellence and you don't get complacent because you ultimately always have that healthy degree of paranoia that, yes, you have just won, but that will not be enough to win the next time, you know? And, and that was the mentality that, that a Tom Brady had um, that kept him successful is he, he constantly invested the time to continuously get better and learn from um, more from those losses than those wins. Um, you, we all learn way more from uh, the, the defeats than we do from the victories. And we've got to make sure that one, those defeats are painful enough to focus the mind on ensuring that they don't happen again and that you learn from them. And they can be really valuable if you do. Mark, anything else to, uh, to add for people-centric culture before we jump into a quick question from the, the chat here? Yeah, I mean, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. I think culture is the most powerful thing that you can have. And when you have a culture where everybody's in it together, there's no finger pointing. It's okay to expose risk because risk isn't always about what somebody did wrong. It's about just what's going on in the reality of a deal. I think magical things happen. You know, I, I'm lucky enough that at Catalyst, I had 10, 10 of the top people at Outreach ever follow me over here to Catalyst. And I think it's partially because of the culture that I create. And listen, I, I don't always care whose fault it is or why it got to way it, way it is. I just want to know what's going on and what can we do to work together to fix it. And I think once people feel that, you start to really understand what's happening in deals and with customers. And, and then that's when you can fix the problems because people aren't afraid to talk about them. But I, uh, I'm a very operationally driven leader. I've been given feedback that I can be a bit sharp. And so I make sure that my leadership team is balanced out with people that are very pro people and understand that taking care of the person helps us take care of the business. And so I'm very uh, intentional about who I, who I bring into a company to help balance out some of my sharpness because together we make a great team. If I am too people oriented, then we don't get some of the operational rigor. If I'm too operationally uh, oriented, then we don't get some of the caring that, and it requires both sides of the coin to get the, the full thing. Yeah. I mean, Peter Drucker said, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, that's a famous quote. Uh, it's been used many, many times. And to be clear, he actually didn't mean that strategy was unimportant, just that powerful and empowering culture was a super route to organizational success. Um, so I think, you know, you can do so much and overcome so much if you've got a really strong, powerful, cohesive culture. Um, so I think you want both. You, you want strategy as well as strong culture, but without strong culture and without people that are bought in to, you know, uh, you know, the, the North star and everything else that we talked about earlier on, then it's really important regardless of what your strategy is to execute against it. Great. Well, team, we have about six, seven minutes left here. So uh, I know we have a couple of questions from the comment section. We'll love to spend just a minute or two diving into some of these. Um, probably fairly unsurprising since it's a pretty hot topic. The first question is about AI. So, um, as AI is becoming more widely used by companies to accelerate work, how do you think AI is going to change the game for revenue organizations? Um, Mark, I'll, I'll kick this one over to you uh, quickly here. Yeah, so listen, I I'm using AI almost every single day. Uh, it's like kind of a better version of a search engine where I can actually have a conversation with a subject matter expert. Then if I ask the right questions and tee up the right stuff, it'll give me the right answers. I also think that there's a lot of top of funnel implication of how people can do certain things right now that take 10 or 20 minutes, but will take 10 or 20 seconds with AI. So there's a lot of stuff there. But listen, I, overall, like, can I directly talk about how it's going to help a specific role or person? I can give some ideas, but I think overall, this is what is most critical is if as a revenue leader, one of your key pillars right now isn't how do I figure out how to take advantage of AI? You will get left behind by those of us that are asking every single week for evidence on our team that we're using AI to get smarter, to get faster, to get more efficient. And so that's a, that's a, about a month ago, I sent out to my team. I was like, listen, 
you will on a weekly basis update me on how you're helping your teams use AI to get, make their jobs easier, faster, and better. And, and so I think that that's the, really the aspect. And uh, again, I go back to always the street cred, always the leader. If you as a leader can't figure out how to use it, then your front lines and your second lines and your VPs and your individual contributors are going to struggle as well. Like you got to get out there and get it. Every presentation I've done in the last three or months or so, I figured out how to use mid journey to create all of my decks and it's gone faster. It's easier. Now are some of the slides totally jacked up? Yeah. You know what? Do I leave them jacked up and then make fun of mid journey in the presentation? I do. <laughs> right. So, but uh, I think that it's really important for people to wrap their minds around how to do it. And I'll never forget the Sunday morning. I was up a little bit earlier than normal. I didn't want to get out of bed yet. I opened up chat GPT and for one hour, I talked to Jet GPT about how to create an ROI calculation for my software. And at the end of that hour, I had the exact math formula with three sided uh, bits of evidence. And I felt like 10 X more informed on the, on the situation than I had before I spent that hour with chat GPT. That would have taken me a month at least to get that done. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would say is like, don't concentrate on how it is, how you can, like what's going on out there, just think about how can you bring it into your own org right now in a way that gets you a little bit better. Yeah, building off that, it's all about saving time. If you can do something using and incorporate AI into your, your daily routine uh, that actually saves you a ton of time, it's back to the stat that I, I talked about earlier is you know, 75, 74% of, uh, of the time not selling, not doing what ultimately is a uh, high return uh, investment of time. Uh, if, if you can use AI to uh, reduce some of that time, um, whether it's research, it's pulling together data, uh, it's writing emails, um, it's, it's ultimately taking and refining what you're doing, uh, doing research, um, customer specific activities. It's just, it's literally, it's saving time. And it's, 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 it's taking a lot of the heavy lifting out of what we used to do. So we're all over it. Um, it's absolutely critical to us um, internally when we think about how we're helping people um, execute, how we're enabling them and how we're making them more productive. So um, AI is here to stay. Uh, AI is very much um, core to, to and will have an increasing impact on everybody's lives moving forward. So we got to get our arms around it and ensure that we're using it um, to our best advantage. I love it. Well, well, final question for you both here from uh, the comment section, the question section is, how can sellers engage today's buyers and motivate them to make purchasing decisions when dealing with information overload, restricted budgets, and large <laughs> buying committees? So, um, Graham, obviously I'm ready, buddy. Give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got it. You've got to be very specific. You've got to think about. You can't talk about what's important to you. You got to talk about and obsess over solving customer problems. If they have a problem, it's going to be top of mind. If you can help them solve that problem and you can link to key performance metrics internally that they're gold on and um, that they're measured by, then you're going to get um, uh, a conversation. Then you're going to get engagement with, with, uh, with those potential buyers. So it has to be, you can't just spam people to death anymore. You can't just you know, when it comes to, um, you know, the old days of, you know, uh, SDRs, ADRs, ultimately just, you know, blanketing emails across territories. You can't do that. you got to spearfish. You've got to very much um, focus on what is relevant, play the long game, be consultative, and ultimately be highly relevant to the, the people that you're talking, talking to. And think of not just what the business objectives are, but what personally um, is going to help them be successful because the psychology of a buyer is they're thinking about their own careers as much as they are their company. So you've got to look and cover all of those angles. Um, and if you can do that, then you're relevant. Yeah, I stole this from my buddy, Nate Nasrallah, who if anybody doesn't know him, he's I think one of the up and coming smartest salespeople on LinkedIn right now. And he calls it three levels of urgency. Level one is 
Uh, the company can't get what it needs. Level two is I can't do my job. And the level three is I am no longer the person that I think I am because I can't do what I want to do. An example of that would be I'm a leader that tries to make my people's jobs easier. But unfortunately, every time I send them to this other tool, it makes their job harder. That violates who they're their, their own self-image. And that's the highest level of urgency you could get. But I was saying right now with my teams, it's pretty simple. He who makes the deal gets the deal. You better get creative on terms. You better get creative on pricing. You better get creative on what you give back. You better get creative on everything. Like I've, I've empowered all of my reps right now. Like piss me off. Like make a huge mistake in a deal that gets the deal over the line. Just don't make it twice. Right. And I want my team on their toes, feeling empowered to make deals, to win deals. And I'll deal with the consequences on the backside and make sure that we don't repeat some of the same stuff over and over and over again. But like what I don't want to do is have somebody get off the phone, have to come talk to me, schedule a meeting two weeks later, and we lost all the momentum. So if you make the deal, you win the deal. So let's go make some deals, y'all. <laughs> have you said I might have said that in a couple of team meetings? <laughs> <laughs> and work your ass off, right, Mark? That's right. Make a deal, work your ass off. Let's go. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, with about a minute or two remaining here, uh, we'd love to hear maybe in just a, a couple of sentences, Graham, if you want to kick us off, what uh, maybe a big takeaway is or, or a charge for our listeners here. Yeah, I, I think we've got to be better than we've ever been before. Um, we've we've got to be focused on having um, the right talent, but we've got to equip, uh, train, and coach that talent to be effective and engage um, with the right messages um, targeted to the right people and be very specific uh, in the value that we're bringing. Um, and we've got to be better than ever before at explaining why we're essential and why we're driving um, ROI. And, you know, we've got to target the specific metrics that, that a company is measured on um, and, We've got to deal at uh, a number of different uh, levels across an organization. And um, we got to sell high um, because at the end of the day, there's no point in working it up. And then ultimately the CFO at the end of the day says, sorry, um, no budget for this. Um, so you got to, you got to be out ahead of it. You got to sell top down. You've got to be relevant and you've got to have strong uh, correlation to value and uh, very specific to that company that you're selling to. So it's harder than it ever has been before. But um, that's when uh, you really focus the mind on being the very best that you can be. And that's what at High Spot we try to uh, do for, for the thousand plus customers that we have today and hopefully the next thousand, two thousand customers that we'll have in the next two to, two to three years. So um, looking forward to helping people be the best that they can be. And I'd say the biggest thing I don't want to leave people with is very simple. We spent the last decade perfecting top of funnel. The amount of juice left in the squeeze of trying to figure out how to optimize your top of funnel in the current market conditions is not worth the effort. There's an area of your business that more than likely is struggling and more than likely is grossly mismanaged. And that's your customer base. They're your greatest revenue asset, but they get the least amount of your time and thought unless they're on fire. So if you want to really maximize growth right now, make the SaaS business model work for you, then you need to spend time starting to think about how you're going to drive incremental recurring impact for your customers because recurring revenue follows recurring impact. And until you figure out how to do that, you will always struggle with churn and loss of expansion revenue. And that will always in turn make you put more pressure on acquisition and that just that that is a spiral that leads you out of control, especially in an environment right now where the ROI. I just read that the ROI on uh, top of funnel went from twenty one percent down to seventeen percent. That's over, mm -hmm. over a, almost a twenty five percent decrease in the effectiveness of spend top of funnel. Why would you keep throwing money there when that money isn't going to deliver what it needs to deliver for your company to grow? And so. Uh, that's what I'd like to challenge people with is if 92% of the lifetime value happens after the contract value, why are you doing 90% of your thinking top of funnel instead of with customers? That's great. Well, want to thank you both so much for uh, the time today and joining the call. Selfishly, I just sat here and just soaked everything up like a sponge. I could listen to you both kind of jam on this stuff all day. So thank you so much for the time. I really, really appreciate it. And Angelica, happy to kick it over to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much, Ben. 
Graham and Mark for your time and insights today. And just a quick reminder for everyone watching, this is going to be recorded. This is recorded. And the key takeaways, all the links mentioned, along with Mark's LinkedIn post, will be made available on the MSP website before the end of the day. So stay tuned for that. And we will see you at the next MSP event. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all.